for, you know, Blake's God of Reason. So Kabbalah says that, you know, that the divine energies come through paradox. Jesuits can hang with that. <laughs> Sufis can hang with that. Taoists can hang with that. Jews have difficulty, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Maybe on the level of the sense of humor, Jewish people can hang with it, but... So, Kabbalah is riddled with paradoxes, and you have to... You can't be the kind of person that believes in either ors to be a Kabbalist. It's a no-go. If you're, you know, if you're a Hegelian uh, dialectician, or you're, uh, you know, you're attempting to look at the universe, it's either this or that, you're dealing with 3D logic, and Kabbalah is going to drive you nuts. So that's why they say that Kabbalah is sweet to a few and poison to many. Like, if you're in that kind of Peshat, simple-minded consciousness where you're looking for black and white, Kabbalah is the last place you should try to understand yourself or the universe from. So they say, don't even bother. You know, it'll drive you crazy. And then it says, well, you should have a mortgage and a wife and all of the grounding things possible before you take the flight into Kabbalah. So, uh, it's good advice. I'm probably about as crazy as they get at this point. <laughs> I've had a few laboratory accidents here and there as a Kabbalist. <laughs> everybody, everybody that explores, you know, the paranormal or lucid dreaming or is interested in other dimensions eventually gets caught in a traffic jam here and there. But the idea, one of the real underlining benefits of Kabbalah, as opposed to New Age work, is the notion that it's very important to build a vessel. If you are the kind of person that wants to channel dimensions, f dimensional energy from other places, and you want to have uh, some ecstasy, and you want to have visits with the Shekhinah, like Moshe did, traveling through the wilderness, then for sure you're going to want to work with your nervous system to get it strong enough so that when those pulsations and frequencies come through you, you're available and you're not going to get fried. Okay? And anybody that does any kind of channeling of any kind soon learns that there are some dangers and uh, you want to get your nervous system tight. Which is one of the reasons why I come to Zev as frequently as I can. Like, because his work is Grim. replenishing the etheric body with that beautiful blue light and it gives you a strength in the nervous system. It used to do that. Used to be that we would do like a couple hours of practice every day, you know, like Tibetan yoga, this and that, to keep the nervous system pristine. But in our kind of crazy universe now, how many people do more than their little twenty-minute meditation or their tai chi or their yoga? We don't have that level of discipline. And from another standpoint, if you want to look at Kabbalah in relationship to India, Kabbalah may be a a particular Hebraic branch of what is it called? Jnana Yoga. It's a mind yoga, okay? Which is considered to be one of the most powerful. It's, it's kind of the cross between Jnana, uh, I'm even pronouncing it a little different than you've heard, Jnana Yoga and Kriya Yoga. The word Kriya is almost a Hebrew word. It means to meet, Kara, Kiryat Arba, Kriya, but it's also Kofreshud, Aleph, something like that. Kriya is to read. To read? Yeah, the crow. But is oh, it with an right. aleph or an ayan? I'm not sure on it's that a one. Y, so it's probably an ayan. Probably an ayan, yeah. I get so used to. So there's the Kabbalah of the nervous system. And some of that Kabbalah was also, there's the other Kabbalah which I want to introduce you to do, which is the Kabbalah of sound. Okay? And maybe we'll do it right now, because there's a couple in this group that really like that. So, give me a Hebrew word or phrase that you want to hear the Kabbalah of. Uh -huh. So, Ahava is the life breath of the Aleph and the life breath of the Beit. The life breath of the cosmic energy that comes out of the wormhole and bursts in and creates the substratum for the universe, little Midrash on the Aleph, that forms the unity principle that underlies matter, and the life breath of Bereshit the expansion, contraction, the process of creation that, that collects energy out inside and then bursts it into the universe, okay? And creates the cosmic container or the vessel for the Aleph energy in bringing it back into a form, okay? So 
the, the infinite energy from the formless bursting out into the universe and being held in the container of the bait, the cosmic bait of Bereshit sheet of creation and bringing it back. Okay? So the life breath of the Aleph, the life breath of the bait. That's kind of a loose Suarez Midrash and Ahava. Like then, I'm <laughs> sorry, <laughs> what did you say? I was asking if the lady would like to repeat that. Okay. Well, just no, re- no, for repet- and, and the repetition in Kabbalah is always different than the first time around. It's always a Midrash or a riff or a spin anyway. So, so Ahava on the vowels is three Alephs, right? It's the Ah sound, which is the heart sound. So the Sufis say, and in, if you look at the Mideastern language, it was meant to keep you in your heart. Because there's so many Ahs, Ahava, Merkava. You know, the words are built on the Ah sound to keep you in the heart. So, and then the, the H sound, the Ha, is a breath, like in the divine name. It creates a universe. It contains, it, cont- it creates what my teacher called a time-space continuum, basically. It's the letter five. It's, it's time, but with consciousness. Fourth dimensional time with consciousness. So, ahava. And the trick is to take that and create it in sound in such a way that there is, a, there is a, what you could call a sonic continuum which is the vibrational frequency of that ah spreading out. So I'll try it a few different ways. We'll see whether, you know, what hits home. So ahava. do it, that's kind of more Abu Lafi and inner sound resonated, but you could also do it So you can take it out and send it out through the breath. So this is a little bit of the science of the high priest, if you will, Kohen Gadol, of being able to take sound that would normally go out into the universe but bring it back into the vessel to vibrate and potentize or uh, resonate all of the all of the chambers within the body and if you put your attention to that with your language and you realize that any time we can stop and go into that kind of meditation particularly with the vowels because the vowels are the modulation of the pure consciousness but with an awareness of how the <coughs> consonants hold that energy then that was a science it was a science of prayer. It, it goes with the melodic of the trope of Hebrew, but was basically spoken of as chanting the divine names, which is another aspect of Abu Lafi and Kabbalah from my standpoint. Okay. Let me give you one or two others. My f- one of my all times... Hmm? Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yeah, I like that. Uh, well, let's just do Shalom first. So, in the, in the Sefer Yetzirah, the Sheen is in the balancing <coughs> of the Chokhmah and the Bina centers. And the Mem is in the belly. And the Lamed is that which pivots, and it's called the arms of the universe. So the Lamed goes out to the twelve constellations. And the Vav in Shalom connects heaven and earth. So here you have a word in Hebrew that brings in the spiritual energy through the Sheen connects you to the constellational grid through the Lamed, connects heaven and earth in a pillar of light through the Vav, and then gives it a cosmic container through the Mem. But you can feel it moving through your body because the, sh- the Sheen sound will go in Chokhmah Bina. The Lamed moves through the 12 meridians, if you will. Uh, the Vav is the spinal column that connects heaven and earth in you. And the Mem is in the belly. So you're bringing, I mean, this is like Chinese alchemy. It's bringing the fire of one center to the water of another. So Shalom, if you contract it, you contract it, you end up with Shem, the signature, the name. If you reverse that, you end up with Moshe. <laughs> Wait, how, how, how? So, Shu.
there's the harmonics of it. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking the vowels and sending them out in vibration like stones on water. Okay. One of my favorites is Eliyahu. Eliyahu, we think, you know, the prophet who comes and visits. If you look at Eliyahu, there's four vowels. A, E, A, U. So his, his name is Pure Vowels. And the vowels actually, if you feel them in your body, come from the Or El Yon down. You think of Eliyahu going up in a Merkava in an updraft, <coughs> but the vowels of his name come down like a TV of light. So Eliyahu goes A E A U. I'll just do it in vowels first rather than using the continents. So it goes. <coughs> There's a parallel thing in the Sufism, absolutely, in what So, you hear all those noises when they're praying. Yeah, there's a certain amount of harmonics in some of the, you know, and that's where, that's where Abu Lafi and the Sufis kind of, Abu Lafi <coughs> picks some things up from his neighbors, but then he put it back into a Hebrew framework. That's my understanding. So, and you're probably in an altered state of consciousness right now from those three chants, whether you know it or not. The sound is the quickest way to turn the dial there. Okay. Not an easy thing to teach, but once you remember it, you kind of want to, you know, it's, it's food for the soul. So I've done my little intro now on the letters, the four kinds of Kabbalah, this, you've had like a little, few little appetizers. Let me know in this moment what aspect of Kabbalah draws you. And I certainly want to give you some teachings on the Tree of Life and Kabbalistic astrology because that's very practical. But I still want to know what's, what you're impractically interested in. Well, I had no idea why I was coming today. Yes. And I love astrology, so it's perfect for me. Okay. We're, we're heading towards astrology. What's your what's your your deep interest right now, Leanne? Me? Yeah, full you. Full moon. The full moon. full moon. Okay. At 11 p.m. That's right. I we take off. I take off on an airplane at 11 p.m. tonight, and I'm going to be able to see it. And we're heading into a time now. Where we're going to see all the planets in the sky. Uh, an astrologer friend of mine said that this is a calendar-making moment that we're in. It is a history. It's a historical moment, and. Really? Yeah, we're see, going to see like a, a star like the Star of Bethlehem with Mars and Venus conjunct, conjuncting Saturn, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. At the, at the end of the month. That's May 5th or 6th. Hmm? The end of the month is very heavy. Yeah, it's a very powerful, you know, all astrologers talked about was the moon Pluto, or the Pluto Saturn opposition, right. but we've got something quite unique coming up. Good to get out to a place where you can meditate tonight under the stars. Be. Tonight will be beautiful with the full moon, but as the full moon, it breaks, as we head towards new moon, then the visibility of the stars gets stronger, yeah? So. What was the new moon this <coughs> month? What kind of angle did it hit? Did you look into it? Uh, I guess I wrote about it. It was around 22, 23 degrees of Aries. Mm -hmm. So in my, I have written an epic poem. I don't have it with me. Called Aleph 2160, and that is symbolically the last day of Passover. So it's like the crossing of, it's the seeding of a crossing of the Red Sea. So I'd say that we're, in, we're historically entering into a time that is an exodus, but it's not an exodus from a land, from one land to another. It's an exodus from one consciousness state to another, which the Sufis call a makum, by the way from one makom to another makom, like that. So... Sfirata Omer starts tonight, No, Sfirata Omer starts the second night of Pesach, so we're already... So we're getting closer to the Shavuot, Shavuot, which is the end. Yeah, Shavuot's the night of the 16th of May, so you could count back, maybe. Yeah. 
said there are four types of Kabbalah. Oh, I was just riffing on it, but I identified four, yeah. The, the Kabbalah of the Otiot, of the letters, which is the Kabbalah that, Kabbalah that I'm most interested in for, you know, understanding Torah and Suarez gives a way for people who are even not even Hebrew speaking to enter that. There's the Kabbalah of the Sfirot, which is the Tree of Life, and Warren Kenton, the so-so job, but he's put out lots of books on understanding the psychology of the Sfirot, and you can connect that to astrology quite easily. Then there's, there's Maaseh Bereshit, which is the Kabbalah of, of cosmology, and there you can go to Fred Wolf, who studied with Suarez, and the, or uh, Stephen Hawking. You can go to people who are like looking at how the universe is, universe is created. And then there's Kabbalah, which I like to call the Kabbalah of names, which is invocational Kabbalah. This is for, and it's not ceremonial magic at all. That Kabbalah is the Kabbalah of inviting beings and masters of light and dimen <coughs> dimensional frequencies to come closer. That's the, and that requires the Kabbalah of the vessel to make one's, one's mouth, one's heart, one's soul, one's mind a vessel for the divine mind, the divine heart, the divine soul. And Sufi, Sufism has an interesting way of working in that, and unfortunately the rationalist Judaic mind didn't want to touch it, because the few people that did touch it became great pseudo-messiahs. Like who? <laughs> well, like Shabtai Tzvi. I mean, it's like if you get to a place where you're doing that, you have a few little divine cities appearing, and you've got some psychological insight, and a little bit of clairvoyance, and a little bit of clairaudience, you, you could hit what you could call Mashiach mind. You could feel the anointing of the crown chakra. You could feel the Shekhinah coming through you. And it would be easy to all of a sudden feel that you've attained that as a permanent state of consciousness and go around and tell people, I'm it, I'm the one. You know, like the ego could easily do that. It's the problem with most gurus. It's the problem with ghost gurus. You've been a, John, you know, he's, he's right, you've been doing a real lifetime study of that. Right. right. Right, right. So, so the Kabbalah always lets you know that you're that you're mm -hmm. a little tiny speck of the yod, and you're connected to the Aleph. So Kabbalah teaches you the paradox of being, being. I mean, Chabad says it very nicely. You should. I mean, if you can get to the place where you are like zero and nothing in your own eyes, meaning that you have no more egoic consciousness left. You're not, it's not, you're not a new age or evaluating where you are in the path anymore. You just dissolve into a mystical oneness now and again and you don't bother to evaluate where you are in relation, you know, on the ladder at all. And that's the teaching that you get in some of the Chabad or uh, Baal Shem Tov teachings where you get, you know, a little, a little guy who's a shoemaker just happens to be one of the Lama Dvav Tzadikim. So, and that level of consciousness is very, very beautiful. It's very, very beautiful. And in that place, you don't have to have much in the realm of divine mind, but you, you've got to have a little bit of divine heart space there. Okay. Um, we talked about Moses, Moshe, in the past. Yes. And is, is the Kabbalah related to the Ba and the Ka in the Egyptian terminology, the soul and the spirit? Well, I suppose Drinvala would think that. <laughs> Whether I think that or not. Or even the Kaaba in Mecca, you know, there's all these... Yeah. Look, at the word Kav also means womb, belly. It's the receptacle. Kof, Beit, as a root. Kof, speed of light. And Beit is Bereshit. So Kof, Beit is taking something that's moving at the speed of light and giving it a cosmic container. What do you mean okay. Kof is the speed of light? Uh, Kof is the 19th letter, when you put it out in Gematria, is 186. Kof, Vav, Fe, Sofit. And 186,000 feet per second, or whatever it is, is the speed of light. So people have, and the letter Kof is your head sitting on top of your spinal column mm -hmm. as a pictogram. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the letter Kof. So. The word oh, for head, I never even put that together. Yeah, Kof. 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 Is that the word for head? Yeah, in Yiddish. Yeah. Kof. Kof, yeah. Kof, yeah. In, gr yeah. in Greek, I assume. Yeah, Kafa. Yeah, the Kafa. letter. Kafa. Yeah. So it's, it's, I mean, Kabbalah, if you want to look at it that way, is consciousness 
at the Adam Kadmon level. Connected to Bereshit, to, to, the, to the burst of creation at the seed moment, and going out through the vehicle of the, of the constellational grid, the Lamed, the Twelve Arms of the Universe, as the, is the phrase used in Kaplan's Kabbalah. I've had one or two people who, said, who thought that Kaplan was the reincarnation of Maimonides. That's an interesting idea. Rabbi Kaplan? Arya, Arya Kaplan. Kaplan. He writes with the that. same impeccable clarity that Maimonides wrote as. I have a, two or three friends who studied with him a long time ago. So. They probably did too much hashish, and that's how they got <laughs> to that idea. Of it. <laughs> it was very simple, very direct, not a lot of mishmash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So numerology is part of that first Kabbalah that you described? Numerology is an, is an aspect of the physics Kabbalah. Numerology is an aspect of Kabbalah Ma Sebereshit. Because numerology is gematria, is harmonics. So numerology <coughs> isn't uh, just looking at a name and reducing it to a particular vibrational frequency. Numerology is understanding that every number creates a grid pattern in the universe. So it's the science of harmonics. I used to do a little thing that I called harmonics of the Elohim. And I believe that there's a quite an unusual mathematical, there's many, there's a few different mathematical systems nested in Torah that are like musical languages. And there's somebody just put out something now, the Solfeggio series, and there's some things emerging. People are looking at biblical stuff and finding that harmonic frequencies are nested <coughs> in certain Hebrew words. It's pretty fascinating. So that's the science of harmonics, where frequencies have meaning. I'll give you an example. I put it in my novel. Christianity is all subsumed with the number 666, right? Because John of Patmos said that was the number of the beast. Well, I say it's all subsumed with it. Well, it's more popular culture is more subsumed with it. Okay, that's right. It was nested in, in one of the Gospels, and then it became, people f got obsessed with it. Subsumed wasn't huh. the right word. And thought that, you know, this is the number of Not a being. Nero, Nero, or an, an, an Antichrist, or something like this. But if you're, if you're a Kabbalist, and you know harmonics, you know that 666 was the number of shekels that it took to build Solomon's temple. Oh. You know it's the number grid of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 up to and including the number 36. So it, it gathers the numbers 36 into itself. And uh, there's some interesting gematria like Shemesh, uh, Shemesh Yud He Vav He is 666. Uh, Le Roche Pina to toward the original face. Is six. So there's there's some beautiful gematria in Hebrew, but the six 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 probably was a gematria in Greek. It was probably a gematria in Greek. But the one that's more interesting in in Pi and Pythagoras was a great Kabbalist too, by the way. So he studied with the Merkava Kabbalists in Alexandria. So Pythagoras is the one who brought the Kabbalah in the Western mind. But Alexandria was, didn't exist at Pythagorean. You bet it did. It did, but it wasn't called Alexandria. Yeah, it had another name. Right. But was there was a group... Of Pardon? Around the time of Philo Judaeus? Exactly. And it was the time of the Merkava school. Mm -hmm. So so Pythagoras yeah. went there, spent a couple years poking about the Egyptian <coughs> mysteries, but got somehow initiated into the Hebrew harmonics of that Kabbalah school. That's where he learned harmonics. Yeah, a, a source. I mean, not the only, but a source. So, so the numbers, the nu a number that follow is always the master of the one before. So, thirty-three is the master of thirty-two, right? Sixty-five is the master of sixty-four. It's the unity principle or the knowingness of the whole pattern. Okay. So that's a good principle to know. It's fascinating because there's no ultimate master then. Absolutely, there's a series of integrations yeah. that happen in life. So that as you attain a certain level of consciousness, you experience the unity principle of that dimension of consciousness and then you move on to your next learning. So 667 is the master of 666. 
So how, what does that become in Hebrew? Anybody want to take a quick guess? Ooh, okay. Six, 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 seven is the Hebrew phrase, refuah shalema. Yeah, oh, wow. So oh, complete and okay, total yeah. healing. Refuah shalema is the integration and the total understanding of what's going on at the 666 six, six level. Well, six is like total physicality. It's like not exactly. Six days of creation. It's the six days of creation on three different yeah. dimensions, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But How it's not. Six, six, yeah. The Gematria. Reish, pay. You have to write it out. Okay. okay. With the Vav and Rifuah. So. They put the 999 number to yeah. oppose the 666. Six, six. Why would they do that? I don't know, Elian. There's a lot of kind of low-grade pseudo Kabbalah floating around the, the universe, and it's coming a little bit out of the keys of Enoch. Not that that isn't an interesting place, but it's like people are always creating, using numbers to create a new age gathering, a new age festival, this sort of thing. I think the nine 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 got pushed by Patricia Cote Robles in Tucson. I think she's the one who worked with that, and it, and it is in the keys as well. Her tact did something with it. I don't know if you were going to mention anything about like um, past lives, like reincarnation yeah. and Kabbalah. That was a whole school in Sfat. The, uh, the Ari, Luria, and uh, the Etzah Chaim uh, was, they were working a lot with phrenology. What phrenology? Uh, reading of the face and reading of the hands and being able to identify what you could call soul root. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, I think there's a Sefer Hagil, Hagilgul or Gigulim, the book of cycles or reincarnations in, in, in Lurianic, Lurianic Kabbalah. Don't think it's in the Zohar. And that, you know, it's like you have to be at a certain station in consciousness to read that. Mm -hmm. How does the Akashic record, record. records fall into Kabbalah? Or doesn't? Um, boy, how to take that one? It's like when you're in a place of where your service work or your work is to interpret that realm because people are on a level of soul remembering. Okay. The Akashic Records is where you go when you're doing what is called soul memory work. Mm -hmm. And that means that you're putting together your understanding of all of your gil Gilgulim okay. and that's a good explanation of your karmic illnesses, diseases, proclivities, relationships, all of that. So it's a, it, an astrologer needs to have some of that, <coughs> but it really, it's much more alive and useful if it comes from within the soul, through the dreams and through memory or, or, or visions as opposed to being gifted, but somebody what who's... Does the, the Kabbalah mention it at all, the oh, Akashic yeah. Records? Well, it would be called something else. Well, what is it called? I don't know. Record. What would it be called? The Book of Sefer Chaim, I guess, mm -hmm. sure. But getting back to past lives, you were saying they read the faces and how did they find past lives? Well, there was a... I mean, in Sephardi Judaism, there was always good phrenology and good reading of hands and eyes, and you know, you name it. But it was prime it was often done in relationship to biblical archetypes. Mm -hmm. So if you if I took you to Tzfat tomorrow, I'm sure that I used to know a palmist in Tzfat. For, you know, it's like Tzfat was where they kind of emigrated to in time, at least in our nowadays. The idea was to see what what whether your soul is from the root of Noah or Yosef, Avraham or or Sarah or Rivka so that you're looking back to see what ancestor energy your particular soul is most in resonance with. Mm -hmm. Now if you're a boy you can see what your Parsha is for your bar mitzvah, you know mine was Noah, you, you know my name is Yosef, I mean you can play with that and you might not be a total pure archetype, you might be like a bridge between. So it's that's the Kabbalah that's sort of taking you to look at your own of life, your own RNA DNA coding, your own genetics, your soul history, but nested in a particular archetypal matrix. Mm. Okay, 
And as time goes on, in the initial phases of that, you may be fascinated with it and you may use it for your personal mythology. But as time goes on and the consciousness becomes less egoically enamored with that, then you may begin to realize this, like Rumi talks about being, you know, an ant and a, a beetle and, you know, being every life form, you know, from the beginning, of, from the first moment of creation to, you know, the bartender says it's closing time. <laughs> This would be the, the words that Coleman Barks would put in Rumi's mouth, being Coleman being an ex alcoholic. <laughs> the, this, uh, this earth is called the taverna in the Rumi works. But they did talk about being sober in the Sufi tradition, right? Being sober? I mean, sober or drunk, drunk with God, you know that. Well, thing. yeah, it's, you know, being a shikr, drunk, <laughs> is, intoxication is soul intoxication right. in that language. That's so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Chabad carries it out in its way, you know, oh, with the yeah. uh, schnapps on the bima. It's, it's, it's part of Hebraic tradition, too. Maybe not mm. quite as elegant. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> so. Ecstasy has a... You know, in many mystical traditions, the idea is to be absorbed in what do they call it, the Godhead or a divine state of consciousness, and just disappearing totally. Whereas the Jewish or Hebrew view of it is more or less a partial absorption, a running and returning, meaning running, going into dissolution and mystical absorption, but maintaining of unique individual identity so that you can come back and speak the unspeakable come back and share your journey with your tribe. So Judaism is very much focused on, yes, go to that mystical place, but don't just disappear, otherwise you'll become like Benzoma, you'll, you'll go into Pardes, and you won't want to come back. You know? How much of Christianity, you know, they just wanted to, Christianity just wanted to split. It was built on a, let's get out of here. And Gnosticism, too, unfortunately, got to that place. You know, Gnosticism, you know, it might have started out in the way that you thought it started out. That, that was... I, uh. Okay. But Gnosticism... <laughs> we won't go there. But Gnosticism eventually ends up... I heard tax and Gnostic. You start be believing that the creator of this, sol of this solar... Of the yeah. What's the old form of Gnosticism? New Gnosticism is not so much a rejection of the world. No, not so much. But the, the old Gnosticism was a, you know, it, the one Gnostic in the Alexandrian Quartet ended up packing it in, if you remember, Purse Warden. Um, no, no, Gnosticism and Christian mysticism that flailed the body was an attempt to leave the physical, which was considered, you know, downgraded evil, whatever, and go back to a more pure state. And it had an overriding belief that the creator of this particular solar system had locked us in. Yes, Neoplatonism has that too. Whereas the Kabbalistic worldview is that this place has all of the sparks, all the divine sparks here. It's a much more sophisticated cosmology. It's Lurianic Kabbalah. That the divine sparks are nested in creation, but there's klipot from former creations here too. <coughs> so that we're dealing with the residue of creations before this one in the energy matrix that are pushing people towards Yetzer Hara, towards the evil inclination. So this is like former creations that didn't work out nested in the substratum that when the psyche is in states of uh, depression or whatever, then these entities that aren't in the physical can take over beings and turn them towards anti-life. So if you look at the Hebrew Torah standpoint, and you realize that, that the whole of Egyptian civilization, and I'm about to enter it in another couple days, was a whole, had a whole eschatology on leaving, like making it back to the world of the imperishable stars. Same with all the funerary rites. There was more, more um, culture in not being there. Exactly. Being there. So the Hebrew people inverted that and said, you know, I put before you death and life, choose life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's much more pragmatic. Forget about the, the, the you know, the, the, the beer for the, you know, the beer for the, the afterlife journey. Bring 
the divine energy into the here and now. It's more a boober kind of mysticism. And there's many, many, you can look at this mirrored in the contemporary view of ascension, right? There's a whole group of beings who look at ascension, they're tired of living, and they want to get out of here and get on to the next solar system. It's, it's they'll enough never over. Ascend. Pardon? Of course. <laughs> right. So, and then there's, a, then there's another group that's realizing that the, that the physical body needs to be absolutely transmuted, and we're bringing as much of the divine consciousness and sparks into into the flesh and into where we are right now and yes we have healing crisis but that doesn't mean we need to say enough I'm getting out of here could you so. comment on remember I said I'm not really a, a scholar of the Kabbalah the Doth uh, neither am I <laughs> Doth Da'at 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 is a portal Da'at in Hebrew means knowledge it's, it's the unification of the top three spherot I'll move to the Sfirot in a bit. Keter, Chochmeh, and Bina. And then Chesed, Gevura, and Teferet. And God is a portal, and it probably sits at the back of the thro- which, what you would call the throat chakra. So Da'at is like a journey into the void. It's sometimes called the abyss. And it's a journey whereby you lose personal identity as you go into transpersonal uh, zones. So it's very frightening. Stop. This is stop. Yeah, it's the one that's got the little fence around it. So you could be in your personal heart chakra in Teferit, and you could have Gevura, mastery of boundaries, and Chesed, compassion, but you're still in the realm of the personal universe. But when you go up into the higher spheres, you will lose a certain aspect of your identity. So Da'at is like a threshold. So in the same, and in the same way that the throat chakra exists for us, and there's a deep Kabbalistic teaching that we create through our voice and through the sound we make and the words that we speak. Okay? So language in the Kabbalah creates reality. This leads you into kind of hermeneutic study. There's certain aspects of language study, you know, that philo- philosophically are, are thought of. In terms of... Um, See Robert Fritz, who's a composer who created the DMA system. As you speak, abracadabra. It's our Aramaic, you know, abara kadabara. As I, you know, I as I create, as I speak. So we create our reality as we choose to bring into the world. Yep. So that's uh, uh, that. If you take the implications of it, then it's absolutely. Hmm? The yeah, the golem is a whole other aspect. <laughs> so, oh really? Yes. Let me catch it next time I'm here. Let me know. I'll, I'll appreciate it. So, uh, that uh, creation with language. Egypt had that too. Like every thought, word, and gesture had this to be in magic. a lot. This is the nature of magic. I mean, yeah. as. Um, but you see, magic, from a ceremonial standpoint, most people think of magic from an egoic point of view. But magic, from the mystical point of view, is more participation in the sea of synchronicity. Okay? Where the thought form is in alignment with divine mind. So, there's a big difference there, and there's a lot of people that have like fallen into manipulation of the world of Asiya for personal gratification of some kind or another. But that's an egoic thing that's happening, whereas real mysticism is way higher than magic. Because mysticism means that there's been a purification that's happened to the soul to get to the place where the soul is at the place of co-creation. That's something else. That's when you've made a contract with the Elohim, the divine energies, to be a vessel for some change. You had a question, yeah. Devar. It's kind. It's kind of like, how do you go past the, you know, like, I have the understanding of thought creating reality. Yes. And how do you get past that? Maybe it's an egoic thing. You know what I'm saying on some level. <coughs> how do you get past that? All that manipulation and getting towards the understanding of God as the creator. Well. 
you know, how to separate yourself as the creator and God as the creator. Because in Jewish understanding, there's God the creator, and we're we're the created. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, if you're creating with your mind, and then things happen. The Kabbalah teaches that creation is ongoing, and that we are co-creators. So that means that you have a level of responsibility for the ongoing creation of the universe through your prayers, through your meditations, through your conversations. So how do we maintain that humbleness? Even if we become co-creators. Oh, we stub humbleness. our toe now and again. That helps maintain <laughs> humbleness. <laughs> we look in the mirror, you know. A relationship Go goes, you know, the rela you know uh, a beloved says, hey, you're not where you thought you were. <laughs> That's how it happens. Okay. You know, it's like we get enough feedback to keep us... Humble, I, you know, we should, anyway. The idea in Kabbalah is to use your creativity as a laboratory to learn about the capital C Creator. So Kabbalah is a path for an artist. It's a path for a painter, a poet, an artist, a sculptor. I mean, I know Kabbalah working in every art form just about. Dance. Hmm? Dancing, dance. So it's how to work with bringing energies into the world of Asiya, into creation. It's a beautiful, beautiful teaching. And it's, you know, it's like <coughs> there's the joy of creativity at the root of Kabbalah, really. And that's why Kabbalah is a good antidote for most of, most of you know, Talmud and Torah and religion and you know because most religion has ethics which is absolutely important to the evolution of the soul but at a certain point you know you get dessert which is the creative level but that's a different level of responsibility you have to be a moral being that's why the rabbis wanted to save Kabbalah until everything else had happened like if you haven't reached a certain station in soul evolution and are intrinsically a moral being. Like Taoists say that there's no reason to, to discipline a child. Like a child, a human being whose inner child is intact, who has received love from parents, will naturally follow the Tao. Mm -hmm. okay. I believe the Kabbalah has a similar viewpoint about a human being. But religion in the moral ethics part is, is very much tikkun oriented which yeah. means the making of a correction okay. uh. there's different levels of correction or setting something upright but the 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 tikkun model came most came more or less out of lurianic kabbalah mm -hmm. because if you look and you see that there's a fallen universe and that there's <coughs> evil and thought forms from other worlds impinging then the work is to set things upright. Jason Shulman has a way of talking about it. He calls putting the Chabad. creator back on his base or something. It's like Chabad. Thing. Yeah, Chabad's working on that one. Yeah. 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 And there's different kinds of tikkun. There's tikkun and nefesh, tikkun neshama. Would a ghost kind of be someone who wants to come be here and make a correction? I don't know. I don't know about that. But think about beings that are caught between realms. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, tr there's an, a vast number of entities, if you want to use that term, or consciousness that hasn't reincarnated, that hasn't gone on. And in a certain sense, any daydream, any thought form, any desire that your mind has entertained in any lifetime could be a ghost, you know? And so how do they, they tr go up to the next level, those kind of Well, things? if they have a... An, in, an integrated place of consciousness, there's usually a fear involved. Like, in the times that I've worked with people that do that work, and I do it very occasionally, uh, you have to make a contract and let know, let, if there's a bribe or a barter that's in place. I remember I was in Mexico once exploring some caves in the Yucatan with a friend of mine who's Scorpio with Moon and Pisces, and I could really trust her to hang in that world. And we went into a cave, and I was it was palpable. There was people that had left. 
and they'd never left. I mean, <coughs> we're in Mexico. Yeah, it was go down to the World Trade Center. They're there. Those beings. Mexico has there. some dark really? stuff going on. Really? Yes. Well, then there, there, there should be some more work done there. I I got a newsletter. I thought it was from you that New Ager said everybody in the World Trade Center had an automatic ascension, and you know, I, don't I thought. Oh, okay. You just pass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're you're what they call a double agent then. But no, there's still a heavy energy. Somebody can move from one dimension to the next level. Yeah, they're stuck in between. What would they do in order to go up? Or they come down? Would. They sometimes can't do. We have to do it for them through mantras or. Yep. Or energy, showing them light. You make a contract with somebody that can help you. So, and we make con we have contracts with our ancestors. It's China. China believes that. I believe that the Hebraic world believes that too. Our ancestors help us from where they are. Where they are, but as we are the genetic embodiment of some of their karma, by clearing ourselves and healing ourselves we actually are healing things in other time dimensions as well and why would that happen that somebody gets stuck in between worlds ah uh, we're all one being so it happens that you're in a tribal matrix and different people explore different avenues we're all perceptual windows for mm -hmm for the divine energy. We are all the eye of Elohim on some level. So at different moments, you know, the aperture gets stuck. Fear happens. You know, I don't know how to say it. The World Trade Center, there's people who didn't even know what happened. They're sitting in their office one minute, and the next minute they're dust. So their consciousness is still stuck. Stuck, I would think. Apart. I mean, we're multidimensional beings, and so you can, if you have a phenomena that you would call a ghost where you have a repetitive, a compulsive type action occurring that in a, in a way so that other, other planes of energy are perceivable here, it doesn't necessarily mean that all, I would say it doesn't mean that all of that greater entity is involved in that compulsion. We are, there's a lot going on in every um, created spirit and just as a part of you can be obsessed on, you know, your social faux pas in the seventh grade, there's there's another part, <laughs> there's another the part that has gone on and has a career someplace, and you know, so uh, we are that vast. I think this is a rather bit of a digression away from. Yeah. I want to get back on the set for okay. but um, I just had to say that because just if you have a compulsive repetitive action, which is what most ghostly phenomena appear to be. It doesn't mean that the entire entity is involved in that. We're, we're big. No. That's called an energy pattern. We all have them in our body. <coughs> we all have places where we have an emotional frequency stuck in an organ, in a, you know, in a, it's a, it's a mind a state thinking. that's, yeah, a way of thinking, a habit pattern oh, stuck. Trauma. It's like post-traumatic stress. Yeah. You could have a nightmare every night of your life. Yeah. And that could be perceivable as a ghost, perhaps, on some other level, you know. So the secret of detrancing is to find a resonance point or to go travel back in the timeline to the moment before the crystallization happened. The healer that I like to I really loved reading about and I met him once was Daskalos. The Daskalos, the Greek because he was a in his own way a master of Kabbalah, a great, great being, and he knew how to he knew how to deal with entities like nobody's business. Just brilliant at it. Daskalos? Daskalos. It means teacher in Greek. Oh Daskalos. Lived on the island of Cyprus. Uh, I would just like to say <coughs> because I do a lot of work with entities and yes. spirits and so forth. There are several different levels, as you say, but they aren't all doing repetitive tasks. Some are obsessed and it is a mental yes. repetitiveness. Yep. But some are right on point okay. and they have something that maybe even for centuries that Why they've been they? trying to enact for good what or ill. And they will come in Okay. on cue to people who are okay. very I sensitive like. or in certain situations yeah. and it isn't repetitive right. they'll come in in the present context and but some are are back in history also it is as you say it's it's a nexus it's a matrix and they don't they aren't limited to our 3d bodies so they're right going to come in 
all yeah. personal evolution is one thing, and, and, and tribal and the evolution of the race is another. So there are certain things that are held in place because they are a kind of a weak energetic link that needs to be overcome. And, you know, so somebody in a lifetime could volunteer to do that one. Let me give you a quick five-minute run through the tree, because if I don't do that now, it won't happen. So, and I'm not even, I mean, this is real Kabbalah from the, the higher levels. I'm not even going to write on it. I'm just going to point. Okay. So, uh, there's a certain zivug or certain connection between spheres and the tree of life. You have the Ketner Malchut connection which is the heaven and earth connection. That's the soles of the feet, the crown of the head. You have the hemispheric connection of the brain, which is Bina and Chokhmah. And different Kabbalists disagree as to right and left brain on that one. Uh, it's quite fascinating. Most people think that the right brain consciousness is in primarily Chokhmah, and Bina is more the left brain mathematical language memory feminine. aspect. Okay? Like yeah. Uh, then there's the chesed gevura aspect, and the chesed is the boundlessness and is the heart in expansion, and the gevura is the heart or the will in contraction. So Rollo May wrote a book about that one. It was called Love and Will. Then you have the netzach and the uh, the hod, netzach and hod, the tap like a computer, and. That is, uh, Zev Shimon Alevi does a good job with that. He calls the hood the, the, the perceptual mind language realm, and the netzach the emotional value, music, dance, rhythm realm. Netzach Yeah, yeah, netzach. Netzach means to lead in music in Hebrew. And then you have the Jungian one, which is the Yesod Tiferet, where the Yesod is the the moon and the teferit is the sun, the yesod is the subconscious, the teferit is the conscious. And that's the one that Jung says we need to kind of bring into balance by around the age of 35, 36, something like that. So these are called, I believe this is what Jesus called the five trees. These five parts of him in Kabbalah are the five unions or conjunctions on the tree of life that need to come into balance. And only, you know, and you get people who are pretty far out on a, <coughs> on a sfirot, and they will call in to their lives somebody who's equally as far out to bring the, the energy system into balance. That's why you get, you know, Blake used to satirize it, and he called in any relationship, there's always, what, there's always someone that's uh, prosperous, and then there's the devourer, devourer. There's always one that's emanating and one that's consuming. Just run through because it's been so long for me. Planets. The, uh, but, but, but the um, English, um, so like splendor, beauty, wisdom. Oh, I don't want to do that because it's uh, it's confusing. But well, let me talk about planets for a second because are, there are a few people here interested in Kabbalistic astrology. I don't even need the map for this. Keter is is considered to be ruled by Neptune, cosmic consciousness, or delusion, depending, you know, psychic impression from other realms. Uh, Bina is ruled by Saturn, but the Hebraic version of Saturn is the Great Mother. It's not the Greek version of Saturn that's cutting off its testicles and stuff. The Greek Saturn version is, a, is an aberrant, whereas the Hebrew version, Saturn is the Great Mother. It's the ruler of the Shabbat. So it's the Hebrew version that's yes. the Great Mother? Yes. Oh. Yes, Bina, the Shabbat, the, the Sea of Compassion. Saturn is which planet? I mean, which... Um, Saturn's going to be in the sky soon, conjunct planet? Mars and Venus. Where on the tree would that be? Saturn would be in Bina, over here. Okay. Uh, the ruler of Chochmah is Uranus, what the Tibetans yeah. call the crazy wisdom. So Uranus is that planet that takes 84 years to go around the zodiac. 84 in Hebrew is the, is the gematria of Chalom. It's also the gematria of Chanoch, Enoch. Mm -hmm. and, Sa and Uranus as a planet is, has its uh, north pole going out the galactic plane. So Uranus can, every time when Uranus was at 27 degrees Sag, pulled in the energy of the galactic center into our solar system. So that was the 
harmonic convergence birth moment. So Hanael would be the angel of that? Something like that. I don't know. I don't know on the angelic realm. It could be the realm of the Hashmalim. Okay. Okay. The electrical beings. Then... Which one is the one? Chochmah. And then Mars is Gevura, which is the power for self-restraint and self-discipline. Uh, chesed is uh, ruled by Jupiter, which is called Tzedek in Hebrew. Jupiter is the ruler of Sagittarius. I'm sorry, what was the question? Yeah, and Mars is which Mars is the ruler of Capricorn. Well, no, Mars is exalted in Capricorn, but rules Aries. Okay. Uh, Teferit is, of course, the sun, Shemesh. Uh, Netzach is ruled by Venus, the emotional okay. feeling center, value center of a human being, which I consider in the body is the spleen pancreas area, sugar balance. And then and there's a whole typology from Sfirot that can show where illness is showing up and why, psychologically. And then Hod is Mercury, which is nervous system. Okay. And, and then, Gemini. yeah. <laughs> and then the Moon Levana is the ruler of Yesod, the foundation, which is what you take in. And then the the Malchut is the ascendant in an astrology chart, which is the last choice that the soul makes coming in, what the degree of the ascendant <coughs> is, and 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 decides where the planets are going to go in the house wheel. So that's a very specific decision. Oh, that surprises me, some of those assignments. Great. <laughs> you need to be surprised. <laughs> so, okay, I'm sorry, sorry to have you no, leave. No, it was great. Thank okay. you. Is there something I can read or something that you... Well, s send me a little email and I'll do okay. that. You have okay. something like a little... I have a little card tucked away somewhere. The astrology of the Sephirot. Yes. Are you going to talk a little bit about the astrology of the uh, pad of the Otiot? All of that Gimel, Dayan, uh, That, I, it's too complex too to do it. It really is. It's too complex. I'd love to. Uh, so I one, would like to... One, one question then. Yeah. What would the relationship be between the moon ruling um, Yesod and the moon being related to Gimel, just to take just one. Do you think the moon's related to Gimel? I, right? do. I do. Why? Well, there's a whole literature on it for one thing, and meditatively, Gabriel, Gamal, yeah. Gabriel the, uh, the high priestess, um, just, you know, the list goes on. It's not my understanding that the moon is related to Gimel. I'll give you the one that I work with. And you, you, you might have to dismantle some of your thought forms to, okay. to deal with it. The seven doubles are Bagad Kiperat, Kapurat, Beit Gimel Dalit, Kafe Rishtaf. My understanding is that that's a journey into the solar system from Saturn. So Saturn is Beit. Jupiter is Gimel because it enlarges and deals with bringing incorporation, bringing things into the body, metabolism. Uh, Dalit is Mars, which is setting boundaries. Kaf is the sun. Pe, beauty, is Venus. Resh is Mercury, which is the nervous system. And the moon is the Tav, which is the boundary that reflects the light back to source. So in that case, the Tav is the moon, which is the reciprocal energy in the universe, the fluctuating energy, the give and take. And then those letters, uh, Keter falls on the central pillar of the Tree of Life. The Kaf is the connector between, uh, this is High Kabbalah, by the way. The Kaf is the connector between the transpersonal realm and the heart energy in Tiferet. The, um, the Tav is the connector between the sun and the moon, Yesod and Tiferet. And then the Resh is the connector between the moon and Malchut, like that. And that's Arya, That's in Arya Kaplan. You'll find it there. You'll find it there. So would you call those Lurianic uh, correspondences? Yeah, maybe. And I'm not a Lurianic Kabbalist. I'm an Abu Lafia Kabbalist. So, but I happened to, I, I looked carefully at Kaplan and I felt like there was one map there that worked for me and I understood it. And you can also say that the letters float from different 
points of perception, you could put each of those doubles in different places. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that I can not become tyrannical <laughs> in, in projecting my... But there's so many, there's so few people who care about that, really. Uh, the idea that I, what I'm working with with Kabbalah is to help let go of the obscurations and the thought forms that impinge on a totally open understanding of the universe. So I'm more a Blakean Kabbalist. That way. I want to cleanse the doors of perception. There's a lot of minutiae that I'm willing to go to, but only when I see that the consciousness has, has clear mind to go to them, to go to that. Otherwise you get, it's a silly debate. You end up in kind of uh, Aleister Crowley land or something. I don't know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. One, one, probably relatively simple. One, not simple. Okay. Well, let's do the simple one first. Okay. <laughs> if, um, if the Shekinah is associated with Malkuth. Yes. How could that? I don't get the um, um, ascendant thing there. Why isn't that Earth? Well, it is Earth. It is Earth, but it is Malch Malchut as the ascendant is your personal point of contact with the Earth energy. Per se, it's well, yeah, it's your window on the world. In a way. Yeah, it's your window. It's where you put your. It's where you take your first breath, where you make your connection with the earth energy. Yeah. Okay. okay. Have a little. So have a little, simple, have a little okay. chat with Sandalfon as an angel. You know. Yeah. With Sandalfon. Sandalfon, angel of the earth. Oh, cool. Metatron's younger brother. I never know. Okay, here's my not simple question. I forgot you were going to ask that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> So, like, not simple, but um, how would you throw the beans of reincarnation onto the uh, table of... The rice field of... Yes. Um, uh, what you've discussed in terms of the Kabbalah and astrology, I mean, because in your work you integrate the three and... Well, you. this is what I look for if I'm looking for signatures. I'm looking for the position of the moon, significant, eighth house is significant, the nadir in a chart is significant, and the aspects to the moon, and the, and the lunar Rahu and Ketu, moon, lunar nodes. So if between all of that, five different areas of lunar no stuff... No nodes in there, huh? No nodes in there. It's nodeless. Did you say you see that from a signature? Yeah, it's like I'm looking at the chart for patterns of significance. And then I have my own understanding of different cultures that the zodiac signs resonate with. So if I see somebody with moon in Libra, and I'm knowing that Libra loves symmetry, like China or something. the Chinese and sometimes Greece seem to be significant path li past lives for people with signatures in Libra. And if somebody's got a moon in Capricorn, they've done some yogic stuff somewhere along the line and they like money. You know, so I have a few little things that are like my little guidebook so, for so that. Was, so it was the sun and placement of the moon, the eighth house, the nodes, um, aspects to the moon. Fourth house cusp, the nadir. The, the nadir, yeah. Eighth house cusp. Uh -huh. All of those, you know. Um, what's, can you give a practical application for Kabbalah? Well. Beyond astrology, every day. I cook, I would say that Kabbalah is the art and science of how to become a conscious creator. And my assumption is that we're all here to learn how to explore our creativity in such a way that we bring in beauty and we bring in divine energies onto this planet. So I consider Kabbalah the most useful, if you want to call it a metaphysical system, if you want to call it a perceptual cleanser in helping a human being or giving, helping a, a human being to understand that we're given a laboratory here beyond the laboratory of our ego and our personality to bring, to purify our, our acts of creation. How do you use it as a, as a, a, that way? Well, there's principles in Kabbalah that you learn that are very, very intrinsic to the creative process. And many, many people struggle in their creativity until they learn those, you know? So Kabbalah, on one level, teaches you how to bring things into the world of Asiya. On another level, it teaches you how to play in the world of Yitzhira, into the in the world of color and form and number and sound.
that. So it's not as, you know, I can't give you a kindergarten answer to that question. Right. I'd love to be able to How do that. How long does it take to learn? Hmm? How long does it take to learn? Lifetimes, come on. You have to be born already a student to get moving with it. Is this a copy of your book? Hmm? This is a copy yeah, of I wanted to close by reading you a little bit. This is a, this is a work, I mean, it's still requiring some editing. Okay, we'll take a quick break. Those people that absolutely need to leave right now, will leave. It looks like Zen's putting on her coat, so we can't have much longer. And what was called the Mount of Configuration, Transfiguration. And I want to read it in such a way, this is my spin on Drinvalo's Merkava meditation, is really what it is, okay? So I'll read a couple paragraphs up to it, and then you can hang with the meditation as best you can, but it, it, it's expl explicating the 18 breaths of that meditation, okay? Let me find out how to love the door. Oh, okay, let's do that. ...up into... Um, Hartabur, in the north of Israel, which is, can some people consider it to be the Mount of Transfiguration. Johanna takes a brief glance at her breathless tribe before mentioning to Kiara that some breathing practices might prove useful that day. Mark notices that there are a number of stone circles set up on a plateau not far from where the Latter-day Saints are resting. Look at this! Mark points with some excitement towards a series of eight rock circles with 17 stones in each circle that surround a ninth circle in the middle. This leads to 153 stones, by the way. Bet's Mark makes his calculations out loud as if he were keeping the score in some important tennis match. Eight times 17 is 136. Call the voice in Hebrew. Nine times 17 is 153. Betzalel, the one who built the Ark of the Covenant. His name means in the image and the shadow of the Elohim. Nurit, who's pretending to nurse Yona at the time, asks Johanna in Dutch, with a translation for the others, if she just happened to find the stone circle th that morning, or has it been mentioned in any of the guidebooks regarding Mount Tabor? Kiara stares at Nurit, visibly annoyed at her presence and her habit of rapping, teasing sarcasm in mock innocence, and replies, The stones appeared before us as we were meditating. We heard some high-pitched whistling sounds like a swarm of cicadas, opened our eyes, and there they were. Akiva asked laconically if they were meditating on anything in particular at the time. Kiara points to the sea and forms Akiva. We were counting fishes. Remember the story where the boys go fishing after the master's resurrection and catch nothing on the side of the boat? And exactly 153 on the right? Akiva begins to radiate mischief and boyish good humor. Yes, ma'am. I remember the passage as clearly as I can see the snow over yonder on Mount Hermon. We must be preparing for a sudden population explosion in the camp of the prophets. Virgin births, to be sure. Or perhaps a Holy Land tour group with 144 hungry members to be joining us for lunch. Mark will cook them up good. Me and Hillel will go fetch us some lemons. He's a Jewish boy from Chattanooga, Tennessee. There's a great idea. We'll send the Sons of Thunder to fetch some lemons for Leviathan that Mark will cook up for lunch, Kiara said impatiently. He was fascinated. Mark was fascinated with the stone circles. Asked Johanna if there were four medicine wheels of four stones for the four directions around each of the 17 stones. You could say that each, of, each set of four represents the four worlds or the four faces that your friend Ezekiel saw in the Merkava vision. What do you see at the center of the ninth wheel? Johanna asked Mark softly. He comes close enough to the stone to notice that there's a perfectly shaped hole in the center of it. Looks like a galaxy or a squashed donut with a wormhole in the middle. There's a name for it. It's called a tube torus, I think. Sarah laughs and suggests, why don't you cook it up with the fish? If you add a little heat, it might melt down into some element we don't get enough of with our daily bread. You know, rhodium, iridium, kryptonite. 
Kiara notices that things could get out of hand and says coldly, leave that shaman stone alone. Um, I keep going. Hang in there for one more minute, okay? Akiva and Hillel come back with baskets full of lemons. Johanna surveys her flock, asks if they feel they're ready to join her in a Merkava breathing meditation. She asks Narit if she's capable of joining the group and keeping Yona, little child, my daughter actually, in the dream state while she meditates. Narit suggests Yona is already meditating and that she's in, she is the one who would like to stay in the dream state for as long as possible. Narit. She's a Pisces, by the way. Johanna arranges her circle of eight around the eight stones, composed of seventeen each. She laughs to herself, says it won't be necessary for anyone to reveal any soul history, childhood trauma, or deeply guarded secrets to anyone at this time. She asks the members of her tribe to focus on a tube of light, no larger. A s I'm sorry. A tube of light no larger than a soda straw that extends from the wormhole at the center of the shaman stone to both the center of the earth and the center of our galaxy. She asks each member of her tribe to open a similar tube in their spinal column that goes out to Keter the crown to the center of the galaxy and out Malchut at the base of the spine to the core of Adama, the earth. Once you have the breathing down and you're visualizing the geometrical form called Kochav David, I will lead you through a series of breaths just be still in the center of vortex. Be a little yod at the center of I of in Hashma. The eye of electricity. Johanna proceeds to guide her tribe through a series of eight breaths, eighteen breaths, offering names for each breath in Hebrew. And this is the Hebraic version of Junvalos Merkava. Ruach Achat, unity breath. Breathe in your sense of oneness with all your relations from your home in the world of Yechida. Ruach Bereshit, breath of creation. Create six days of creation as a star of David around Bereshit. Okay. Breath of creation. Around yourself. Ruach Gilgal. Breathe in all the wheels and waveforms. Breathe in all your past lives. Breathe in the sweet air from the hills of Galil. Ruach Gan Eden. Breathe light in through Keter, your crown, the way you used to breathe in the Garden of Eden before our fall into the time-space continuum. Ruach Agaman. Breathe in your five soul bodies. Breathe in the angels that surround you. Uriel, Raphael, Gabriel, Mikael, Nuriel. I'll chant those for you. We'll ask those little angels to linger in Zev's healing room for a while, if they choose to do it. Breathe in the pillars of light that connect you with Adam Kamon, Ruach Vavim, Ruach Sheva. Breathe in the covenant, the promise, the oath you made before you came into your body. Ruach Hevron. Breathe in the love that the eight ancestors have for you. Ruach Hateva. Breathe in the earth energy that supports and moves through you. Ruach Eitz HaChayim, breathe in light to fill the ten spheres of your tree of life. Blow this light gently from Teferet out to the rest of the universe. That's the tenth breath, blowing it out. Ruach HaKochavim, breathe in the light of the stars from the heart of the sun. Ruach Elohim, breathe in the gift of the co-creators. Breathe in the divine breath. Ruach, Ruach Mashiach, breathe in your own anointing at the pineal gland at the third eye. Ruach Hineni, breathe in from your nefesh center in the belly, breathe in from your neshama center at the pineal gland, pineal. Breathe in both the serpent and the dove, 
Balance the earth energies and the star energies within you. Breathe in the Ahava, the love that created you in connection to all beings in the universe. Johanna pauses in her meditative guidance for a few minutes to allow Nurit to complete the gentle sobbing that is pouring through her heart. Mark opens his eyes for a moment to feel the love vibration she is holding for the tribe in the unified field in that moment. He feels his own heart go out to his daughter and Nurit before returning to interior space. Johanna continues, Ruach Hasa'ara, breathe in the whirlwind, the counter-rotational spinning vortices of light that are beginning to emanate out from the heart of the circle, of our circle. Breathe in light, breathe out love. Ruach in chashmal, or ayin chashmal. Breathe in at the eye of the vortex. Breathe from the still center at the core of all electromagnetic fields and spiral galaxies. Breathe in the void. Ruach ha'ofanim. Breathe in the alternating faces of the energy field we're creating this very moment. Let your consciousness <coughs> approach the speed of light. Johanna takes in a deep breath, blows it out through her mouth for a very long time before the 18th breath. Ruach Chai Olam. Breathe in the infinite life energy. Breathe in the life breath of this universe. So that's a condensed little journey through the 18 letters as codes for each of those 18 breaths with as much of a Hebraic spin as I could give give it so that it becomes a teaching. It's a beautiful meditation. I'll probably put it on tape at some point. I just put it into Johanna's mouth because it was easy to, easier to do it that way. So that's from the Transfiguration section. I hope as many people take to this book as, you know, Celestine Prophecy or something that got popular. Will you... Have you uh, published this? It's waiting for an agent to send it. I would like Harper Collins to publish it. Uh-huh. Do you have an agent that's sending it? No, I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to give me the name yeah, of, it, of an agent. I don't, I don't need to look at that expectation. <laughs> Looks simple to me. You're looking at the paper. What, what, how, would, how would you draw the five trees? Oh, I was talking about five parts of theme on one tree. But uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, it, it no, does I say know, that the five, five trees, trees in that, paradise. And, that, you know, yeah, so I believe that these are, each of these is a life energy, a tree into and of itself that it probably spreads out between the parts of him. No, I understand. But so I don't know how to draw it. So, so the five, the five what in each what? Parts of him. The five pairs that are complements and oh, polarities of one, of one another oh, within sure. the tree Oh, sure. Yeah, duh, yeah. yeah. Good. And then also you have five ancestors, too. That's a teaching in Kabbalah. You know, With Abraham, like, Isaac, the, Jacob, yeah. Joseph, and probably Benjamin. I had a very interesting dream. I'll yes. tell you this. Long time ago, I dreamt there was a naked priestess like nine months pregnant and written across and this was before I had studied the Bible and long before I knew anything about the Kabbalah and um, and written across her naked pregnant belly was the name Jacob and um, and this like booming voiceover of the dream came and said what is the symbolism of this name and I, I had to answer the question as you know the dreamer, and I freaked, and I answered correctly, but I didn't know what the answer was when the I woke up. The reward for answering it correctly was waking up, right? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you, if you did. And, and um, I answered correctly, but I, when I woke up, I couldn't remember what the answer was. But a friend of mine, very observant Jew, had given me a book on Kabbalah that he said he wasn't allowed to read, but he thought I'd be into it. And um, but I'd never read it. I'd never cracked it open. And um, but I was like th thinking about this. It was one of those big dreams, you know. And um, so I pulled at one point during the next couple of days. I pulled the book off my shelf, and in the different sefirot were the different patriarchs. Uh -huh. And then um, and Jacob was in the position of Tiferet. Mm -hmm. And um, there was other things that I interpreted the dream as meaning, but I thought that was cool that Jacob was. Yaakov is um, the one who wrestles with Elohim and has, in the way that my teacher said, he almost has a sex change, meaning that he starts out working in a very male way, but he has a very strong feminine way of working. Hmm. So he, so actually he's working in a feminine way, and then he needs an act of gevura to wrestle with the angel, and then he becomes what in Hebrew is called Im Yisrael, 
the mother or the source of Yisrael. And he becomes, you know, that becomes the whole notion of wrestling with the divine energies. And it's only after that that the, that the one called Benjamin is born. Mm -hmm. All the others are born before his wrestling. So Benjamin or Benjamin becomes the archetype of the messianic energy yes. that comes into the world after that Which is integration. I would, I would think that Benjamin would be into Pharaoh, but um, um, different Kabbalists will do it different ways. Yeah. You know, there's freedom in Kabbalah. So thank you very much for coming to Zev's office. <laughs> And in his little healing waiting room, and let's hope that what we, uh, as the Buddhists would do, will dedicate what we did today to the healing of all beings who sit in these chairs from now until the end of time. Okay. How nice. How nice. <laughs>